Hey everyone, and welcome back to the third installment of the Building a Smart Home Cheaply series. Today we are actually going to be installing Home Assistant onto our server or dedicated computer. So at this point you either have a Raspberry Pi or a 24-7 computer that you can just dedicate to the purpose of running Home Assistant. This video is going to be divided into two parts based on the way you're going to approach this. If you're doing it by a Raspberry Pi, it'll be pretty quick and easy. We're just loading it onto an SD card, plugging that into the Raspberry Pi and booting it up. Now, if you're doing it through a dedicated computer, we're gonna be using virtualization software called VirtualBox. And if you're not familiar with that concept or if that sounds sort of intimidating, don't worry. As I said at the beginning of this whole series, I will walk you through everything. And then if you have any additional questions, I'll be ready to answer them in the comments below. Now I'm gonna be honest with you. If this is the first time you've worked with a Raspberry Pi, it might seem a little bit confusing at first. And if you've never used VirtualBox software before, you might be like, what are we even doing right now? But then the good news is that by the end of this video, you're gonna have Home Assistant software up and running on your device. And we can answer those questions after the fact. I think it's good to know what you're doing, but I also think it's good to keep making progress. So let's make some progress and let's get started. As I said earlier, there's two main parts to this video, one for the Raspberry Pi and then one for a dedicated computer. If you're doing the Raspberry Pi way, keep watching because we're going into that one first. But if you're using a 24 seven dedicated computer, use the scrub bar below, the play bar below, to skip to the part relevant to you. There is one final part to this video that applies to both sections and it focuses on how to access Home Assistant once you've installed it. If you're familiar with how to do that, then you can skip that part. But if you have any questions about how to find the IP address of Home Assistant once it's up and running or what that means, then definitely watch the last part of this video. All right, without further ado, let's jump right in. All right, change of wardrobe. It is currently 11:19 p.m. and I decided I wanted to film the Raspberry Pi part of this video now instead of tomorrow because uh, that's how excited I am. Also a little bit of uh, acne cream on the face. 24 and you still have these problems. It's really unfortunate. Okay, so personally, I'm actually the biggest fan of using the Raspberry Pi. If that wasn't already evident by the previous video where I talked about the Raspberry Pi for quite a bit. Uh, the Raspberry Pi is actually the easiest way to install Home Assistant, um, but the first way is the most cost effective given that you already had a computer on hand. Uh, so congratulations if you just bought a Raspberry Pi and you're working with it. Uh, congratulations if it's on the way. And then if you already had one, you're one step ahead. So I talked about in the previous video how the Raspberry Pi uses this, you know, the micro SD card. So the operating system and all the storage for Home Assistant is going to be on this little guy. Of course, when you get your micro SD from Amazon or in your Raspberry Pi kit, it doesn't come with Home Assistant on it. It's completely blank. What we're gonna do is we're gonna flash the image of Home Assistant onto this SD card. Essentially, that's just a way of saying we are going to load Home Assistant onto this guy. This process is actually very easy. So the only thing you'll need if you're on a laptop that uses USB-C and doesn't have a SD card adapter, you're gonna need one of these little dongles, unless you've found out a different way of doing it with a little micro SD slot, um, or you can get an SD card adapter if that's the only kind of slot you have. The dongles aren't expensive and the adapters are very inexpensive. So if your SD card came already inside of the Raspberry Pi, go ahead and take that out plug it into your SD card reader and plug that into your laptop. To load Home Assistant onto the SD card, we need a software called Etcher. Just search for that. And it's from a company, I don't know how you pronounce it, but maybe Belena, Belina, who knows. But click on that. We'll go to their website. I'll put a link in the description and download the software. It's compatible with Windows and Linux and Mac. Once you have Etcher installed, you're going to want to download the Home Assistant image file. I'll include a link to that in the description. When you're presented with this page, choose the recommended option based on the version Raspberry Pi that you have. In my case, I have the Raspberry Pi 3 Model B, and I'll be downloading the 32-bit version as it's recommended. Okay, now I'm going to plug in my SD card reader. Okay, so let's go ahead and open Etcher. And let's select the file that we downloaded.
and let's choose our SD card as the target. And we're going to press flash. You might be prompted to type in your user password for this action to process. Okay, so we can see it's decompressing the download. It'll then flash it onto the SD card and then afterwards it'll verify that all the files were put there correctly. This process could take anywhere up to 30 minutes. So just keep an eye on it and you should get notified when it's done. Once we put this micro SD card back into the Raspberry Pi, it's going to be ready to start. My recommendation is to plug it directly into your router with an Ethernet cable. You can have it connect over Wi-Fi if you would like, but the setup involved in that is just a little bit more complex and I'm not going to go into that in this tutorial. But if you would like to figure out how to do that, you can go to the installation page in the description and there are instructions on how to get your Raspberry Pi connected to Wi-Fi. The reason I don't recommend Wi-Fi is that when we're running a smart home hub, we want it to be able to interact with devices with minimal latency and we want to decrease the chance of any connectivity issues. When Etcher is finished, you might get an error that says that the disk you inserted is not readable by the computer. Don't worry about that, just press ignore. If you're really set on connecting your Raspberry Pi over Wi-Fi, then you're gonna probably need to disconnect the micro SD card when it's done flashing and reconnect it. And then you should have a drive appear, which will let you then follow the instructions uh, presented on the Home Assistant website for how to get connected over Wi-Fi. Okay, but now that we know our SD card is ready to go, we can go ahead and put that into our that I'm gonna take out my old SD card and we can put that now into our Raspberry Pi. Eventually. I'm struggling. Cool, let's go plug this in. Okay, we're now in my noisy closet and we have my router and we're gonna get this set up. So we're just gonna essentially plug my Raspberry Pi via ethernet into my router. And then we're just gonna plug in the power cable to the Raspberry Pi. I only have two hands, so uh, I'll show you the end result. Okay, here we go. We have the Raspberry Pi connected to the router, and then we have the power cable plugged in. And you'll know the Raspberry Pi is getting power when you see the LEDs lighting up on the board. Let's go back to our computer. We're going to be using something called VirtualBox, which lets you run a virtual computer, otherwise known as a virtual machine. As you can see, I'm on Mac, but it doesn't make a difference because VirtualBox exists for all major operating systems and the interface is the same. Just as an example of how VirtualBox works, you install it, you run it, and it lets you run, for instance, uh, Windows on a Mac or Linux on a Mac or Linux on a Windows computer. It's essentially this contained computer simulated and isolated from your main operating system. This concept is pretty cool and it's called virtualization, but we're not going to dive too deep into that to get started. Go ahead and go to the official VirtualBox download link in the description below while I'm talking and install it. Just as some background information, it's created by Oracle, which is one of the largest software companies in the world, and they're actually utilized by most enterprises. In short, this is a safe application, safe to install. On the VirtualBox website, you'll see that it gives you a few options based on your operating system. So in my case, I'm going to choose OS X hosts, but if you're on Windows or Linux, you'll choose those corresponding links. With VirtualBox and competing software, you can import and export virtual machines in what are known as VMDK files, which stands for Virtual Machine Disk Files. Essentially, they're just this bundled template, which tells VirtualBox how you want your virtual machine configured. This therefore saves us a lot of time in setting things up. Thankfully, the Home Assistant developers have already created a VMDK for us to import into VirtualBox. So just go ahead and follow the link in the description to download that. And it should be on a page similar to this, and you'll see a link that says VMDK. Click on that and download. By the way, if any of these links no longer work, just leave a comment below and I'll update them. In the meantime, just do a quick Google search and you should be able to find what you're looking for. Okay, once you've downloaded and installed VirtualBox and you've downloaded the VMDK file, we're ready to actually go ahead and launch our virtual computer, which will be running Home Assistant. Uh, one thing to note is that if you go to your download, 
and you find that the VMDK file is a .gz file, just on Mac, you double click that and you can expand it. Uh, it's essentially a zip file. If you're on Windows, I believe if you right click and choose extract here, that will also work. You just need to unpack this archive. Okay, so now we have it unpacked. Let's go ahead and open VirtualBox. And when you open VirtualBox, you'll get a screen something like this, a screen something like this, and you will want to close out of any windows or prompts that might appear until you get to this page. Okay. And the first thing we're going to want to do is create the hard drive, the virtual hard drive that our computer is going to use. And to do that, we're going to, in the tools menu here, click on this and click on media. There's another way of getting here, by the way, uh, in case the UI has since changed. In the top left, you'll go to File and then Virtual Media Manager. OK, now that we're on this screen, we are going to go to Add. We're going to locate that VMDK file and we're going to press Open. Um, and we're going to click Copy at the top. We're going to create a virtual box disk image. Let's just call this uh, you can use the default name. In my case, I just want to call it this. Okay, so here we have our .vdi file. You can go ahead and remove the .vmdk. Uh, you can choose keep to keep the file that you downloaded on your system. We just don't need to track it in VirtualBox anymore. Okay, the size is up to six gigabytes, meaning that it can grow up to six gigabytes in size. Um, you'll see that the actual size is currently just 630 megabytes, uh, this hard drive, but as Home Assistant uses more data, it'll need more space. My recommendation would be to use about 15 gigabytes, meaning that it can go up to 15 gigabytes in size uh, before the hard drive is quote unquote full. Um, this is independent of your current hard drive. Obviously, this is going to consume space on your actual computer's hard drive. Um, but as long as you have 15 gigabytes free on your actual computer, I would set the cap to be about 15 gigabytes and we'll go ahead and press apply. Okay. In the tools menu, we're going to go back to the welcome screen and we are going to click the new button because we're creating our new virtual machine and we're going to call this home assistant for the type, just choose Linux. And for the version, choose uh, other Linux 64 bit. Click continue. For the memory, I'd recommend anywhere between 1024 and 2048. If you can go higher, go for it. Stick within your green bar and realize that if Home Assistant is fully utilizing that amount of memory, that amount of memory will not be available to your primary computer. Um, if this is truly a dedicated 24 seven computer where you're not going to run anything else, you can bring it up pretty high, but stick within the green bar. Okay. I'm going to go continue. You're going to use an existing virtual hard disk file, and we're going to use the one that we just made, which is the, in my case, 15 gigabyte, uh, expanded hard drive. And we're going to click create. All right, so now we've created a virtual machine that actually has the Home Assistant software already loaded onto it. It can grow, in my case, up to 15 gigabytes in size. And we're going to go to settings at the top there, and we are going to go to system. We're going to change how it boots, um, and we're going to enable EFI mode. If we don't check this off, it won't recognize the software and it won't boot to the drive we just created. So enable EFI. Then we're going to go to network for the adapter one. We're going to enable the network adapter, which it is by default. But instead of NAT, we're going to do bridged adapter. Now, the computer that you're currently on, take note of how it's connected to your network right now. If it's using Ethernet, you'll want to choose your Ethernet adapter on this list. If you're using Wi-Fi, you'll want to choose the Wi-Fi adapter. I'm using Wi-Fi, so I'm going to use EN0, uh, the actual label of which may be different on your computer. But normally it will be preceded by an actual description. So in this case, Wi-Fi. Um, on Mac, if you're using Ethernet, it would likely be the USB 10 100 1000 LAN. Okay, now we're going to press OK. 
Okay, now we're going to start this in a headless start. And you'll see in the top right that it's actually booting up. If we want to see what's actually going on, we can click on the show button and it will pull up on the screen. You'll find probably that if you try to expand this and it's really small, it doesn't seem to really uh, expand at all. To fix that, you can go to the view menu and you can go to scaled mode. Now try it again and you can read everything clearer. You may run into this one time issue where it gets hung up uh, and the text is no longer scrolling up and the last line you might see is at the bottom here, copyright Intel Corporation. Uh, it's actually getting hung up on uh, the network driver. So essentially the adapter we just set up. To fix that, go ahead and go back to VirtualBox, right click on your machine and click reset. Accept the prompt, it'll reboot and it should be booting up properly. You'll see a bunch of OKs, you'll see some bolded white text, and you'll see mentions of Home Assistant and has OS, the name of their operating system they've created, and it will continue to boot up. Just as a point of clarification, you're not gonna be accessing Home Assistant regularly through a command prompt. It has a website interface, which is very pretty and easy to interact with. This is just for getting it strictly set up what we're gonna do now is just let it run for about 10 or 15 minutes and let it finish setting up. Okay, since Home Assistant is essentially now joined to our network as a dedicated computer, we're gonna to need to be able to figure out how to access the web interface for it. In order to do that, you're gonna to need to know your router's IP address. Now, if you have a router that was set up by AT&T or Comcast or whoever your provider is, and you haven't touched it, it likely has a sticker on the side of it that tells you the IP address and the login information for your router. If you set up the router yourself, you're probably already familiar with what the IP address is and what the login is. Now I'm on a Mac, so I'll show you how to get your router's IP address on a Mac. If you're on a different operating system, you'll probably want to Google how to do it. On a Mac, it's really just as simple as going to your system preferences screen. Then you're going to go to network. Then you're gonna to go to advanced and you're gonna to go to TCP IP and you're gonna see a field here that says router. You're gonna copy this address, close out of this, paste that into your browser, log into your router using the credentials either written on the sticker on the router or the credentials that you had set up at one point. and you're gonna to wanna to find the page that tells you the IP addresses of the devices connected to your network. So if we scroll down, we'll find that Home Assistant is joined to the network and we're gonna find that its IP address in my case is this right here. If I copy this, I'm gonna open a new tab, I'm gonna paste it in and I'm gonna put a colon 8123 and I'm gonna press enter. So now we can see we are accessing Home Assistant through its web interface and we're being prompted to create our account. We have successfully installed Home Assistant, it is running properly, and we are good to go to the next video. All right, that wraps it up. We have now installed Home Assistant on our dedicated device. Whether or not you used a Raspberry Pi or used a dedicated computer, at this point it does not matter because now we are all on the same page. In the next video, we're gonna dive into how to explore the Home Assistant UI. And then going from there, we're gonna get it set up on our smartphone so that we can access it remotely. And then we can get cracking on some automations. So if you haven't already yet, consider subscribing for more related content. And I will see you in the next one.